from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of AWS reInvent 2020. Sponsored by Intel and AWS. Everybody, welcome to theCUBE's virtual coverage of AWS reInvent 2020. I'm John Furrier, your host. We are theCUBE virtual, not there in person, but we are doing uh, remote as is AWS. Although they're, they're on stage live and we're here with Dave Brown, the vice president of EC2 Compute. Great to see you again. Um, great keynote last night, kicking off everything um, for the opening night. Great stuff. Great. Yeah, well, John, it's always good to be on theCUBE and thanks for having me back. You know, you're in the hot seat these days in the sense of there's so much going on. I mean, Andy that could do a three week announcement keynote. It was like I mean, three hours of nonstop. You, you take a break to go to the bathroom, you missed two announcements, right? So, so much going on. Uh, you opened up reInvent 2020 with your announcement, EC2 of Mac instances. And then there was a ton of compute and the theme was really, you know, reinventing and reimagining compute both. I want to get into that, but let's start with the hard news. Tell me about the Mac instances. Um, you had a great use case there that kind of illustrated in your talk, but where's this coming from? Is obviously Mac developers are big, but is this market something that you guys saw from customers or um, was a necessity? Take, take us through the thinking around the Mac instance, EC2 for Mac instances and yeah. what it's targeted for. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, me, me personally, I'm a Mac user, a long time Mac user. We've often thought about, could we ever bring uh, Mac OS uh, to AWS, right? This is something we've spoken about on and off for many, many years. And, um, you know, it was about a year and a half, about two years ago, you know, we were always hearing new use cases from customers. And that's kind of what we're doing. So we're saying, what are customers trying to do that we don't support today? And how would we support them in that? And um, we started to hear from customers that they had been able to successfully migrate all of the AWS workloads, you know, to AWS. So most of their server workloads to AWS, and they've they've got this Mac build workload that they just weren't able to bring to us. We just didn't support Macs. Now, Intuit was a great example who I had on stage with me last night, where you know they've over the last couple of years have been moving a lot of their workloads to AWS, and and then they had these Mac Minis sitting around that they had to manage themselves. And so we said, could we actually do this? And so that was the one thing the customer asked. And the other thing that we realized was with the Nitro system and the work that we've been doing there over the last you know, six years, seven years, uh, since 2012 really, and just where we are from, the, from a Nitro system point of view, we were able to wrap an, a Mac mini without making any changes to it with Nitro cards, plug in a Firewire uh, to the Thunderbolt port and, and, and actually control that device. And so it means that you get the best of Apple hardware, which is what Apple's all about is, is the hardware that they make and the way that their software works with it together with the Nitro system and the cards around that, inter integrating with the rest of AWS. So we're giving you, you know, high speed, secure networking. We're giving you great access to Elastic Block Store, which just integrates natively into the Mac Mini as well. Um, and so we realized that the technology was there, the customer ask was there, and then obviously went to Apple and worked with them very closely to make it happen. And so that's kind of how it all came together. And I was incredibly excited to announce it last night. And the feedback today has just been amazing. A lot of excitement. Yeah, take me through the use case because you know obviously there's two trends going on. There's custom chips and serverless kind of thing happening where you guys, I mean, really doing a good job of the IaaS layer, innovating there, and then platform as a service, all that software on top. I totally get that. You can see that happening. Chips, custom chips to Intel, AMD, and others. Now you got Mac hardware. Where's the innovation use case? Because one would start would say, hey. Why do we care about whether it's Mac hardware or not? Because I'm serverless. I should be programming the infrastructure. I should be getting compute uh, generically. Where does the Mac tie-in come in? Because that's the first question I was thinking of was, I'm a Mac user, I love Mac, but I'm also got some Windows action going on now. And ultimately, do I really care if it's compute? What's your reaction to that? Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, so if you look at Apple's ecosystem today, right, they have millions of applications in the App Store. Um, they have 28 million uh, developers worldwide um, actually building those applications. Uh, it's just incredible. And many of those applications, well, there's millions in the, in the app store itself, there's many more applications that are built by enterprises and companies, right? We have an application that we use uh, internally at Amazon that's available on my phone that's not in the app store. And, you know, many companies are doing that. And uh, to build applications for the ecosystem, they have to be built on Mac hardware. 
and that's just how Apple works, right? So if you want to build for iPad or iPhone or you know even Apple TV and uh, Apple Watch, you have to build those applications on a Mac. And so what we see companies doing is, you know, the old developer meme of, well, it works on my computer, right? When you build something, you don't want to be building on your local laptop for production. So they typically have a fleet of machines that they, you know, either under somebody's desk or in a data center somewhere that they use for, for building uh, these Mac applications. And so uh, it's not possible to build a Mac application on anything other than a Mac itself. And we, when we looked at it, we really didn't feel that virtualization made sense, right? Uh, Apple, I mean, they have some some virtualization that they're able to do uh, within macOS itself. But if you think about how do we solve the customer use case? It's really bringing Apple hardware um, to EC2 to solve the problem and giving customers that exactly same the exact same experience that they have on prep. And if you look at Intuit, like that model's just worked, right? We gave them beta access. Uh, you know, they've been using our beta, which we normally say, hey, don't don't run production workloads on a beta. But, you know, I found out in my interview with uh, uh, the VP at, at Intuit, Pratik, that they'd actually moved 80% of their production build workloads to EC2 already to run on the Mac instances. And so that, and that's in the space of two months. And so just that seamless ability to move because it's the same hardware is kind of what we were going after. Uh, great, thanks for sharing that insight. One thing I want to uh, point out is Mac does have their own chips as well. They're going custom chips. Amazon's going custom chips. And I think I think you nailed what I was trying to understand, which is this is a developer community for Mac and there's some things that are purpose built for Mac devices. So, uh, and Mac ecosystem, you get the marketplace as well as you know, obviously hardware, you know, PCs and devices, yeah. and they're only doing more and more. So this brings me to the IoT, um, uh, piece of it because Apple does make devices that people wear, <laughs> iWatches, um, iPhones. I mean, they're not computers anymore. They're everything. So yeah. this kind of brings up the edge conversation. So whether it's an iPhone or a 5G in a Metro or I'm at a stadium watching a football game and there's some sensor camera vision industrial thing there, this is the new normal. This is where you guys are kind of eating, eating up the, the, the software side of that, that business because there's new capabilities here. Can you explain how compute, specifically EC2, gets to the edges? Because no one wants to move data around. They want to move compute, not data, because data is expensive right. and it's and it's fat. So we you know, we talked about that. We keep on years yeah. ago, but you got to yeah. move compute. So how does that work? Take us through your vision. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, and this is this is a you know a massively growing area for us. I mean, you mentioned Apple's new M1 uh, silicon, Apple silicon that they just launched as well, and we're super excited about what Apple's been doing there. We've been doing the same thing with our Graviton 2 processor, and really saving customers an incredible amounts on price performance. Right, um, customers moving and getting 40% improvement in price performance just by moving to Graviton 2. It's just incredible. Um, but in terms of the edge, you know, we started this journey. Uh, we started this journey quite some time ago in bringing, you know, Lambda functions to CloudWatch and things like that. Right? How do we bring compute to the edge? Um, when we took a look at 5G, which I think is going to fuel a lot of this, right? If we if we look at our cell phones today, I was actually just talking to the Apple team yesterday, saying, well, the iPhone only came out, you know, 13 years ago. It's kind of amazing to think just how much progress we've had and what 4G did. Um, for the device that's in our pocket um, in terms of, you know, just how much we rely on that today and what we get. Well, 5G is just a step function in both in terms of, of latency, um, but also in terms of throughput. And so, you know, one of the projects we announced last year with Verizon, and we now, Andy announced this morning, we we're also going to be rolling out with KDDI and SKT Telecom and Vodafone next year, um, is a project called Wavelength um, that brings AWS compute to the edge of the telco network. And so with Verizon, we now have eight locations around the US where we have AWS compute capacity. And what I mean by that is literally C5 instances, uh, you know, G4, uh, GPU instances for customers that want to do inference and graphics processing on the edge. And that's embedded into the 5G network. Uh, and so customers, you know, we've got a number of customers that are doing a lot of interesting things um, with 5G in the in the sports uh, area where they have 5G cameras that are, you know, submitting directly to uh, wavelength where you no longer need to drive a truck to a stadium to record a game. You just have 5G cameras um, to, you know, automated uh, factories uh, where they're doing robotics in factories and need really low latency and they don't want the computer in the factory. They want it in 5G. And so just an exciting area for us that's growing really, really quickly. The other thing we did is obviously with local zones. Um, we launched our first local zones in LAX um, last year, Los Angeles. Um, and that's been used by the movie industry. So, you know, right now there's a lot of exciting, you know, they're up and running after COVID and a shutdown for a period of time. And 
filming the next release of all of our favorite episodes and across all of these various streaming platforms. And a lot of that work is actually the post-production is being done on, a, on AWS, on G4 instances within the Los Angeles region. So, you know, very low latency for colorization, animation, special effects, all that sort of things happening there. And what we heard from a lot of customers was they love outposts as well, which is our offering to put a server into a data center. And you heard from Riot Games in Andy's keynote, where they actually bought a number of outposts and put them all over the US and also other places of the world to really lower the latency for their latest game. And so what Andy also just announced is the availability of three additional local zones. So Atlanta, Miami, and Houston, sorry, Boston, Miami, and Houston um, available today. And then an additional 12 availability uh, local zones next year. And what that does is that sort of spreads AWS capacity, compute capacity at the edge in all of our major metropolitan hubs. All of that capacity is on the AWS backbone as well. Um, but brings customers that low latency connectivity that they're looking for gaming developers where you know every every millisecond counts in terms of gameplay. And so super excited to be going after that use case, which I think you know it's difficult to tell what the next 10 years are going to be like, but I think latency is going to have a big part to play in in the types of applications we see on our phones going forward. Great stuff. Well, final question for you as we wrap up. Um, obviously with virtualization, with this, not virtualization, but you know, the COVID, as Andy pointed out, people are going to change. There's going to be winners and losers. He kind of clearly pointed that out. But the people who do lean into the cloud, who have been on the cloud are taking advantage of the tailwinds of COVID because of the capabilities. Their EC2 bills are higher and you should be happy for that. But they're also going to have more demand for you to say, hey, I need more services. So how, how do you speak to those people who are leaning in, who are leveraging more compute, what should they be looking at? What kinds of services should they be connecting into compute? How should they be thinking about the future of compute so that they can take advantage of those capabilities, the lower cost, higher performance? Yeah. What things are complementary for these customers as they come in, not toe dip in the water kind of things, really driving in, what do they need? Yeah, absolutely. And this has been a big focus on us. You know, uh, this has been, as I cover in my uh, keynote, which or leadership session that I'm doing tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, um, you know, a lot of this year has been helping customers through COVID and what COVID has meant for their business, whether that is cost savings for many of them or whether it's just demand, you know, that they've never experienced or expected before. I um, mean, we've been incredibly hard at work in, in servicing those customers, right? I actually catch up with Scott Sakura in my keynote, who leads our capacity team. And we talk through what it meant and how we actually provided the capacity that our customers needed um, during COVID times. But if for a customer moving to us, the first thing is obviously, um, we want to find ways to make them very successful on the cloud but, but more importantly, lower price performance for them. So what we want to do is give them the best possible performance that's available at the lowest possible cost. And if you look at a number of the announcements that Andy made today, you know, whether it's um, our latest Graviton processor where you can, you know, when you move to ARM, I think customers often overestimate how much work it will be to move to ARM. And when I talk to them after they've moved, they say, hey, it wasn't actually that much work. We actually got it up and running relatively quickly. So a lot simpler than people expect, but that's an opportunity to save 40% on price performance. Um, you know, these new, newer workloads like our graphics, we just launched a new G4 AD, which is an AMD based um, GPU solution. The first time we've had an AMD GPU on the, an EC2. And that's also looking to save, you know, upwards of 40% price performance over other GPU offerings. So just incredibly exciting for graphics workloads. And then in the machine learning space, like I think if, you know, machine learning has just become the new normal, like everybody's doing it. And, um, you know, just three years ago, everybody was thinking about whether they should do it, how, would they, how they would use it. Now that it's, you know, a lot of companies are doing it, it's really, how do I, how do I use it more? And um, that comes down to again saving costs. And so what we, you know, with with our inferential chip and then the new Habana chip we just announced it with with the work with Intel that we're doing, and then our new Trainium chip for training of training, we're really working to lower the cost of machine learning. And so like we've seen many customers, like Alexa was a great use case the other day, being able to lower the cost of inference for Alexa by 35%, again just helps customers um, you know, move to the cloud. But I mean, just generally, you know, we're trying to support customers everywhere, whether, you know, if there are many customers are in their own data centers looking to move to AWS, um, you know, we have great models that can support them with our existing compute. Um, our new savings plan offering we announced last year, just great for saving costs um, and getting the price down. So there's a lot you can look at. It's, you know, I can go on it's, forever, really. <laughs> it's, it's certainly, it certainly is more, we'll, deep, we'll do a deeper dive, follow up after reInvent, but it is a wake up call as I wrote in my post um, for a cloud. Uh, and finally, I've been saying this for years, horizontal scalability is a disruption on the infrastructure side, but you got vertical specialization with data to create great modern apps with machine learning and AI actually playing out in full display here, as Andy said, um, net right now. So all this benefits and all these opportunities to disrupt horizontally and then leverage the data 
all tied together, all coming together. You're you're leading the team. Dave Brown, Vice President of EC2, in charge of the team that's driving the future of compute. Thanks for coming on the Cube for Cube Live coverage. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Okay, I'm John Furrier with the Cube. Back for more live coverage after this short break. 